An hour later, at 3 o'clock, me and my father made our ungainly way out of the inn and strolled to the Bombay house. My heart was pinched with joy and excitement, for I'd never laid eyes on or even been inside the royal building of the East India Trading Company, which was deemed one of the most prestigious and richly furnished buildings in all of London. Not to mention the excitement I felt at seeing my father in action. Once leaving the inn, and the, once leaving the, inn the stable boys had scrubbed mud off the carriage that took us and curried the horses until the black coats shone like polished marble. We had plenty of time to bathe in the basin and had our new coats, pants, and boots sponged by a chambermaid before it was time to head to the appointment. The Bombay house stood behind high walls and was set in a substantial garden within a, st within a stone throw of an inns of court. An easy stroll from the headquarters of the East India Company on Leadenhall Street. There were guards to the high wrought iron gates, but they swung them open as soon as my father said his name. Three footmen were waiting at the double doors of the house to usher us in and take our cloaks and hats. Then the major domo led us on a succession of grand rooms, hung with mirrors and huge oil paintings of ships, battles, exotic landscapes, and lit by forests of wax candles and crystal chandeliers, and gilt oil lamps held aloft by statues of nymphs, elves, and blackamoors. As we traveled further, the grand public rooms gave way to meaner surroundings, and I realized that we had entered the private room of the great house closer to the kitchens and the servants' quarters. At last we paused before a door so small that I might have easily passed it by, where the head steward knocked once, a step, once with his staff. Remember that, just observe and watch, he muffled to me, and his long gray hair swayed in a bushy pigtail down his back. I felt nerves in my veins, but we pressed on. Yes, sir. Thank you for letting me come. And he, mer and he merely smiled. Of course. And death! We went a voice from the far side, and we traveled through the opening, and I found myself in a richly decorated cabinet. The paneled walls were hung with tapestries from Arabia and the Indies, and the space was only just sufficient to accommodate the large table pile high with silver chafing dishes and gilt tarans, which emanated succulent aromas and enticing wisps of steam. Punctual as usual, Lord Beckett complimented my father. The man was old and wrinkly and fat, and slumped in the gilt chair dressed in the most famous finery or golden or golden threaded coats, and a wig adored his head that was powdered with flour and blush of violet was on his cheeks. Forgive me for not rising to greet you properly, Hearthstone. Damned gout again. He indicated his foot swathed in bandages, resting on a stool. You have met Oswald, of course. I have had that honor. My father bowed and gestured to me to bow as I leaned forward at the Chancellor. Good afternoon, my lord. We met at Mr. Samuel Pepys' house last August in 1665. Good afternoon, Sir Francis. I well recall our meeting. Lord Hyde smiled and gave him a half-seated bow. You are not the kind of man one readily forgets. It was an interesting start to the early dinner, I realized. Then the two older men gazed to the right where I was standing. Sir Beckett smiled dryly. I was <laughs> not under the intention that you were bringing a guest in our midst. This is my son, Henry Hal Hoster. I thought I'd let him observe our meeting as a learning strategy for his studies. He will not get in the way, I promise you that. Lord Hyde called to me. How do you like your father being in the cabinet of the East India Company? Very fine, eh? <laughs> he laughed. I found his response a bit irritating, talking to me like I was a child, but I gave him a smile instead. It is fine, sir. Uh, my father has succeeded, as you may know, in many voyages across the Atlantic. He's a great sailor, and I admire him for it. I want to be just like him one day. I nodded, and my father gave me a teary-eyed look and a slight smile through his Van Dyke stash. So, will this observation be for your studies, lad? Beckett asked, cunningly. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm still in school, I muttered. How old are you, boy? Hyde asked. Sixteen, sir. I turned seventeen in November, I smiled. Splendid! <laughs> well, lad, I hope you have an appetite for food, for we have the most presumptuous staff in all of London, preparing the finest cookery. Beckett licked his lips like a fat pig. <laughs> I can't wait! I grinned. Beckett waved us easily and informally to the chair at our front. Sit so we can talk. Take off your coat and wig, man. Let us be comfortable. I took a seat on my left next to my father and stretched my boot under the white cloth table to stretch my knees for the long carriage ride from earlier. I realized my father never wore a wig and instead stroked his thick silver hair. Ah, of course, you do not wear a wig. Luckily that hasn't gone bald. Damned sensible. 
Well, we are all victims of fashion due to the city. <laughs> the other two I saw had close cropped heads and were in their shirt sleeves and their collars loosened. Beckett had a napkin around his neck and they had not waited for a visit before eating. Judging by the pile of empty oyster shells, Beckett had already accounted for several dozen. I shrugged off my coat as did my father and a footman took them. What do you fancy, Hotstone, the hawk of the Madeira? He beckoned to one of the servants to fill my father's glass. Does your son need wine? I would be delighted, sir, I smiled. How is your wife, Lila, and Maria, your daughter? How is the farm? I know you prefer the quiet life rather than the smoke of the city. <laughs> I'd smiled. My wife is fine, tending to the house and helping me with my investments. She always has a helpful hand towards me, and, my, and we recently attended the opera ball created by the playwright and poetry man, Mr. Frederick Mancia. It was splendid, and she enjoyed the music and acting to an expense. My daughter, she turned nine this spring, I believe, and is as cheerful as a honeybee. The farm and crops are holding well. My father chose the hawk while I chose the Spanish Madeira, a sweet red wine from Portugal. But I enjoyed it, in which it had a sweet taste to it, more like berries. I could tell this was going to be an immense supper, and the Madeira was a very sweet, it was very sweet but powerful. Once our glasses were filled and a platter of huge English oysters lay before us, Beckett dismissed the servants to talk freely. I grabbed an oyster, its rugged gray shell almost cut my hands from its needle-like coating, and I slurped in the mush feeling the slimy coat of its meat, and tasting the sand and salt of the sea. Before I knew it, almost immediately they were in heavy conversation of the vexing question of the Irish War, which made my brain boil. The disposed King James had sailed from Ireland to France to raise an army among the Catholic faith and supporters there, and was attacking the forces loyal to King William. Oswald Hyde bemoaned the coast of a campaign, but Beckett rejoiced at the, at, at the successful defense of Londary, of Londonderry, and Inkskillian by his Majesty's by his Majesty's arms. You can be certain that as soon as the king has taken care of the Irish, he will uh, turn his full attention back to France. Oswald Hyde sucked another oyster from his shell and looked unhappy, an expression that seemed to come naturally to him. I shall have to go back to Parliament for another approbation. Even though I lived in London my whole life, my father never failed to keep me well informed on the events of the day, for he had much friends in London and corresponded with them regularly, and I would listen to their conversation in the drawing rooms late at night when my father and his comrades played cards and dice. I watched my father and he was able to follow the weighty twists and turns of the conversation and even make notes. Uh, we have a little choice in the matter, he said. Once Louis invaded the Pal Palatinate, we were forced to act against them in accordance with the terms of the Alliance of Vienna. My father pounded the opinion with which the others concurred and I sensed their approval, although Hyde cottoned to bewail the expanse of a continental war. I carefully slipped another oyster into my mouth and washed, and washed it down with a gulp of red wine. I sat quietly letting the men discuss their matters. I agree, there must be a war with France, but in God's name we have not paid yet off the cost of the Dutch war. The black boy and Jamie left us with debts owing to every bank in Europe. The black boy was the nickname people called Charles II, the Merry Monarch, in which my tutor had taught me the knowings of the royal courts. Jamie was James II, who succeeded him and ruled for three years before his overwrought Roman Catholicism forced him to flee to France. William, the Stadtholder of the United Provinces of the Netherlands and fourth line of the succession, had been invited with Mary, his wife, to take the throne of England. Mary was the daughter of James, which made their claim to the throne all more valid, and they're a Protestant. Once the oysters had been dealt with, Beckett called back to the footmen to serve other dishes in which I dived straight into with hunger. I fell upon the Dover sole as though it was an enemy, then went to the lamb and beef with three different flavors of soup from the silver gilt turons to wash them down with the red claret. My father eyed my hunger and ushered me to slow down, for it was taken as rude to feast more than the royal court advisors. My father, I noticed, sipped sparingly at a glass for the conversation was fascinating, and opened insights into the intervening structure of power and world politics, for which I had no appetite for. I followed his example and did not let the wine cloud my mind. The talk ranged from topics I'd never heard of before, like the coronation of Peter as the Tuz of Peter as the Tsar of Russia, to the incursions of the French into Canada, from the massacre of their settlers in at Lachin by the Iroquois Indians in the New World, to the rebellion of the Mughals in India. The last conversation piece finally appeared to be the true reason of this meeting, the affairs and fortunes of the English East India Company. I watched my father as I could read his mind in the shipping investments he was planning to offer. 
I then noticed a change in our in our ruler's moods. Their eyes became shrewd upon my father, acting like I wasn't even there. I understand that you are a considerable shareholder in the company, Lord Hyde asked randomly. I was fortunate enough to purchase a little of the company's stock when I returned from my last voyage, years ago in the east, in the 40s. My father admitted modestly. And since then, from time to time, when my fortune has been kind, I have added to my holdings. Beggett waved away his disclaimer. All the world is aware of the exploits of you during the Dutch Wars and thereafter with Captain Nelson in the 1620s, adjacent to the Mayans and their very considerable additions that you make to the privy purse for the prizes of war, and the fruits of your trading voyages to the Spice Islands and the eastern coast of the African continent. And hearing of all my father's adventures, it made me admire him even more, making me want to go on such a journey. He turned to me. Do you know your father holds 4% of the company's stock, son? <laughs> Yes, sir, I said quickly. He turned to the Chancellor. It does not include the dowry of which my daughter is being married to your eldest son as well. I looked impressed as he mentally catcalled the monetary value that represented it. A valiant and resourceful sea captain, you have proved yourself, Hyde murmured, and a prudent investor. You richly, de you richly deserve those rewards. I noticed he was watching both of us with a piercing gaze. More likely, your personal interests are lying to our own. The Chancellor went on quietly, rubbing his cropped pate so he had the short, stiff hairs rasped under his fingers. We are all stockholders, the crown the largest of all. Thus the recent news of the East Indies affects us all most painfully. My heart hit a sinking spell. What were they asking of my father? My father straightened in his chair. Forgive me, my lord. I arrived in London only this morning and have heard no news. You are fortunate then, for the news is not good. Becca grunted, and lifted a lump of beef dripping blood to his mouth. He chewed and swallowed, then took a gulp of wine. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, a company ship, the Bully, tied up at the docks. She was 62 days out from the Bombay with a cargo of cotton and cocknel, and dispatches from Gerald Anger, the governor of the colony. Becca frowned and shook his head. <sighs> we have lost two ships, the goddess in the spring. Her father rocked back in his chair. Those are the those two are the pride of our fleet. I knew this was the ship. I knew that these ships were East Indian men, big vessels, lords of the oceans, built for carrying cargo with prestige of the English crown. Wrecked, Hyde coughed. <coughs> Wrecked, my father hazarded. Losing any one of those vessels was a terrible blow to the company. I could see my father's plans for investments were plundering. Where the hell were they wrecked? My father demanded. The Algos Bank, the coal reefs of the Mascanis. They are not wrecked, said Beckett ominously. What then? I asked this time and the three men looked at me. Beckett's lip pulled back like he sucked a lemon. Pirates. Are you sure? How can we know that? My father asked worried. The Indian men were built for speed and heavily armed for such battles. It would take a warship of force to bring it down. Now the company's stock would plunge. My father's own investments would be slashed by the thousands, ten thousand pounds. I can see the fury in his, in his eyes. For months now, both ships have been overdue. We had no news, Beckham continued. But it seems there were no survivors, except for one man, strapped to the wreckage, drinking rainwater and eating raw fish. He was able to catch until he was at last thrown up on a wild coast of Africa. He walked for weeks along the shore to reach a Portuguese settlement at Lobitio. There he was able to find a ship bound for Bombay. He told his story to the governor and he sailed home here. I leaned in intrigued by this news. I heard of the pirates before, men who ruled the seas with no law in their pockets, taking all the Spanish gold from the English ships as they wanted because they simply believed they owned it. Fierce warriors on the sea with no fear of death. Where is the seaman now? My father spat. Beggett held up one hand to hold the future questions. He is safe, well cared for, but we don't want him telling his story on the streets of London or in a coffee house. My father nodded. And yes, I spoke to him. He seems sensible and resourceful if his account is true, which, uh, I think it is. What did he say happened? I asked now, and my father gave me an eye. I told you not to intervene. His tone cut my heart. Hyde merely smiled. Now, Francis, he's only a boy. He simply is just curious of the conversation. Let him participate. My father gave me another stern look as Beggett continued to tell the tale. In essence, the ship came upon a small rowboat in distress off the island of Madagascar, 
and took all off took off her crew of a dozen before she sank. For the first night, the survivors seized control of the deck during the middle watch. They concealed weapons on the persons, and they slit the throats of the officers. Of course, the crew of the ship should have had a small had small trouble regaining the ship from such a tiny band of pirates. But they swept. But they swept out of the darkness. It was too late. How did this man escape? Most of the men were killed, but this man, Leonard, I recall, convinced the pirate captain that he would enlist with his band and lead him to other plunder. Leonard then seized his first opportunity to escape and slipped overboard through a gun port with a wooden keg as a float. Beckett opened a silver casket and brought out a long wooden brown object that looked like a piece of dead tree bark. Tobacco leaves roll into a stick, <laughs> he explained. They're Spanish from the Coldies in the Americas. They called a cigar. I have come to prefer them to the pipe. Will you try one? Let me prepare one for you. Oh, would your son smoke one? <laughs> I have never smoked before, sir. I so quickly. Nonsense, boy. It is the greatest wonder in the world. Hyde grinned. He made two fuses of sniffing it, and cutting the sliver off the dark tobacco from one end. My father and I sniffed it together. The aroma was surprising, surprisingly pleasing. My father followed Becca's example and lit the end of the tube of the match Becca gave him. I put the cigar in my mouth and it tasted awful like dirt. My father helped me light mine. I watched the flame on the end of my plant spark and smoke and then I puffed tasting a raw bitter taste that stung my tongue. I blew the smoke out and coughed horribly as it stabbed my lungs and choked my neck with a burning sensation. That is awful! I yelled. I assure you, my boy, that I presume that a cigar is the most favorable. Hyde grinned through his whiskers. The three men laughed and my father giggled and smoked a cigar, favoring it. <laughs> you don't have to finish it if you don't like it. My father laughed and took the cigar from my lips, which I was happy from that. By now both of the men were puffing on their cigars, which gave my father a few minutes to consider the problem with which Beckett had presented him. You said two ships were lost. Yes, Beckett agreed. The spring only weeks before the other, taken by the same gang of cutthroats. How can we be sure of that? The pirate captain boasted of his exploits to this man, Leonard. Another long silence. After another long silence, my father asked, What do you intend to do about this, Lord? Then my poet pulse quickened as I saw the two men exchange glances, and I had the first inkling as to why my father was invited here in the first place. Beckett wiped beef, beef fat from his jowls with the back of his hand and then winked at my father. We are going to send someone to deal with this pirate, Teach. Edward Teach, uh, Blackbeard is what they call him. Some say he swam around the ship three times with his head off before hopping aboard and he makes packs with the devil. <laughs> Who are you send? My father asked, knowing the answer. Why, you, of course. My father blinked. But, but my lord, I am now a farmer and a country squire. I have a family to take care of and those sailing days are behind me. I was... I was planning to make investments on three ships in the bay. The Cambridge was one. I have the money. You may make those at another time in your life. Many years from now. But I have given my life to this comedy's cause for twenty years. My father gritted his teeth. My heart raced through my ears. I did not want him to leave me. I could not imagine a life without this man beside me. And if he were cut down by a cutlass from a ship raid or blown to bits by a cannon, I could not bear it. I felt anger round rise of these two men trying to break my family apart from some medi mediocre comedy scuffle of money. I rose to my feet at the table, swayed by a little wine. No! I screamed. You can't take him away from us! All three men looked at me in confusion and aghast. Henry, what are you doing? Sit down now! My father exclaimed. Boy, you best. How dare you, sir! I am appalled at the way you have discussed, used and treated my father in such a disgusting fashion. For what? What is it? Pride? Money? Profit? Trade? New ships? What else do you possibly need? I say let the pirate Blackbeard take down as many of my f many of your ships for you insult my father, and therefore you insult me and my family, including my mother Lila and Maria Victoria, my sister. And yes, sir, I may be speaking out of turn, but you sit there with such a defying look on your face. Aghast simply because you know deep in your guts I am right about you! I have watched the way you slung your words this entire meeting, and the manipulation and gab you have batted against them is more than devilry! 
My father's investments in this company for the years have helped you succeed in power and rot. All you do is throw him to the wolves. Go to hell, sir! Henry! Excuse yourself and sit down this instant! I leaned on the tablecloth and stared directly into Beckett's pupils, and I saw for a second a twinge of worry and fear, only a slight sparkle. He then slowly turned to my father. I was expecting you to train your boy better in the economy of words. I suggest you exit this building before we toss you out, Francis, or have your boy hanged. My father was trembling with rage and slowly was brought and brought his coat and hat. He gritted his teeth and bowed slowly. Good day, my lord. Once we were out of the Bombay house, my father grabbed the scruff of my pigtail and dragged me to the building next door and pushed me against the wall. What the fuck were you thinking, son? You just insulted one of the most powerful men in England. Do you understand that? You have, of course, you could have cost me my job, my dedication to this company for years, and it was possibly in the gutter. You have made a great mistake, you bastard. We shall speak of this in the carriage later. No! I shook him off me. You cannot leave to do this business with that pirate. We might never see you again. I did not involve you, tis all. My father now saw the true intent behind my eyes on why I had stood up for him. He softened his toad a little. <sighs> Look, I understand your worries and frustrations, but these are wealthy men, Henry. I signed a pact with them to help collect trade from all corners of the globe for them. In turn, I will get my share to support them. I can't just say no when... When someone sends me someone, I must oblige. But you have me and Mother and Maria. You can't abandon us. What will we do without you? I can't bear it, sir. I love you too much, Father, to see you die on some ship in Africa. Tears crowded my father's eyes and he rested his hand on my shoulder. I understand your concern, lad. I will not die. I still be survived all the other voyages. He said with a grin. I will not take the job, and I am sure I will not get it anyway for what you said to him. Perhaps. <laughs> I laughed a little. I am sorry, father. It is alright. I am sure Beckett's and Hyde will get over the insult. He is a hard man to break. Now, after all that hullabaloo, we have an hour before the carriage arrives. You may go see a woman. <laughs>